Jesse Biddle is an American professional baseball pitcher in the Arizona Diamondbacks organization. He was selected in the first round of the 2010 MLB draft by the Philadelphia Phillies. Biddle has previously played in the MLB for the Atlanta Braves, Seattle Mariners, Texas Rangers, and Cincinnati Reds. This is Jesse Biddle. Jesse Biddle, welcome to the Rare Humans Podcast. I'm stoked, man. This is going to be fun. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Evan. I appreciate it, brother. Of course. So uh, we got a lot of lot to dig into, man. I'm stoked. We actually met a couple weeks ago. It was super random, and got to the point where you had mentioned that you've you know been in and you know professional baseball, playing professional baseball for gosh, what is it now? I think you got drafted in 2010. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So this will be uh, my 14th season coming up. Amazing, amazing. I mean, that's a, that's a long time to be in the league. Uh, I got so many questions just to dig into. I mean, I grew up watching my older brother, Ryan play baseball and it was just like, definitely one of the most grindy sports out of all of them. I feel like, um, just from watching him and, uh, even watching, uh, baseball on TV. Um, you know, really the first thing I wanted to get into with you is when you realized you had a serious shot, um, at, you know, being in the MLB, playing professionally, I know that you um, were drafted right out of high school, right? Yeah, yeah, I was drafted out of high school. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm from you know inner city Philadelphia, and there's not a ton of baseball players out there. It's definitely not really like a hotbed. Um, I think most of the best athletes from like where I come from played either football or basketball. Um, so I really had no idea if I was any good or not. You know, I was just playing against a bunch of kids in the city growing up and. Um, kind of had, I was just hoping to maybe get into college using baseball and, and help my parents, uh, be able to afford it. You know, that was really the whole plan. Um, and, uh, I, I was, I think I was 15 years old when I went to my first like big national tournament, I got recruited for a, a team, um, out of Philadelphia that, that traveled and we went to this big tournament and I did pretty well. And I was like, all right, let's see how far we can, let's see how far we can ride this thing, you know? Nice. Were you, you know, when you were playing at a young age, where like how was that social life balance? Like, were you full on board with baseball the whole time? Like, were you were you a multi-sport athlete or were you just grinding baseball? Like that was your goal, that was your vision all along. Yeah, man. I mean, I was so I'm I'm six foot five right now. I was six foot five when I was in eighth grade. Uh so I stopped growing after I turned 14. Wow. Um, you were six, so, five when you were 18 or when you were 14. Yeah. Yeah. I was that's, like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I was super skinny, but I was like a pretty good athlete. So I was thinking to myself, like maybe basketball could be a good Avenue. You know, there's a lot of good basketball players in Philly and um, I was playing a lot of tournaments and doing pretty well. But by the time I got to high school and I stopped growing, I realized like, Oh, I'm, I'm not very good. <laughs> you know, I'm like a guard <laughs> height but I don't really know how to dribble that well because I've been a foot taller than everybody my whole life. Um, and then all of a sudden I started playing against guys who were six, eight, six, nine. And I was like, Oh no, Oh no. <laughs> um, so I, I transitioned to kind of focusing on baseball full time. Um, you know, I'm left-handed, I'm six foot five. And uh, those two things usually add up to just like, you know, giving you a, a good option to, to play specifically pitcher, you know? Nice. Yeah. There's always that one quote. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone specifically that said it, but there's, it's like, there's always going to be someone out there, taller, stronger, faster, <laughs> better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you realize it. I think some guys realize it um, in little league, some guys realize it in high school and then some guys it takes them until they get to the major leagues or they get to the NFL or wherever to realize like, Oh man, like <laughs> there's some impressive people out there. You know, I got to work for this. Yeah. And how, I, you know, I'm not sure if you're like looking too much into this like newer generation of baseball players, but is there quite a bit of difference from when you were that age to, to now these kids that are coming out of high school, like, are they pitching high nineties? Like they're just stud athletes or how have they kind of evolved um, over the last decade into, you know, these next draft classes of, of athletes? Yeah. I mean, I think it's true with every sport, right? Like you watch the evolution of basketball because of Steph Curry um, you watch the evolution of baseball because of analytics, right? Like it's just changed the way that we view pitching. It's changed the way that we view hitting. It's changed the way that we view training. Um, so these kids coming up, man, 17, 18 years old, throwing hundred miles an hour. Um, 
I, I respect it. I think it's amazing. Um, I'm trying not to be the old guy who gets stuck in his ways. I'm trying to learn as much as possible at all times. Anytime I meet a coach who I think has a, a lot of knowledge that I can gain, I just kind of stick in his back pocket and learn as much as I can. Um, but it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's super fun to watch the way the game is transitioned. I think, you know, as soon as you become the guy who, um, just wishes that things were the way that they used to be is, is when you get swept away and, and when the game forgets about you. So I'm very fortunate to be able to keep my playing career going. And I think part of it is just, um, I have just, uh, I need to learn. I, I just, I love it. I really do. Yeah. And that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you too, is, is, you know, as a professional athlete, you have access to, um, you know, some of the best coaches in the league. Uh, you know, how was that, during the development of your career, um, you know, how was that working with these, these coaches? And did you have anyone um, specifically that you, you know, learned a ton from, or that was just really like a great mentor of sorts? Like, do you have any, uh, anyone that stands out or any coaches, notable coaches, or how was that experience with those coaches? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? You know, I started as a kid, I was 18 years old. I got drafted out of high school and, um, so I've, I've had, I've obviously had a lot of coaches in my career. Uh, some have been really great and some, some haven't been as great, right? Like the only thing I've ever asked out of a coach is just, I want them to work as hard as I'm working. You know, right. I want them to care as much as I care. Um, and even if the, you know, the information that they end up giving me might not be the exact right thing, I want them to have a reason for why they're giving it to me. You know, I, I just want to have a coach that I'm able to conversate with, not a coach who, who basically tells me what to do. Um, I think that's how we grow both coaches and players. Um, but one coach specifically uh, would be uh, who, who's become one of my best friends in the world. Um, there's a pitching coach who I, I met. He was the the pitching director for the minor leagues with the Cincinnati Reds. And when I met him, I, I was when I was playing for the Reds, um, he was 25. So he's very young. And I'm wow. I was so I was a few years older than him. And it was during the um, during the COVID season. So we were mid quarantine and um, I had the opportunity to work with him every single day. And all we had is baseball, right? We couldn't go to any restaurants. We couldn't, you know, go hang out anywhere else. All we had was the field and then home. And so every day I would just sit in his back pocket, talk to him as much as possible, try to get as much information as I could, because I could tell that he just cared so much and he wanted all of his players to succeed. And he, you know, he'd be texting me at, at midnight with all these new drills he wanted me to work on and all these new things because he was watching video and until 2 a.m., you know, and it's just like that's that's a very, very rare combination and something that, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, very thankful to him. Yeah, and it's always inspiring to, to have those relationships, too, because when you work with people that don't treat it like a job and more of like their life, like that's their livelihood and and, you know, it's it's even like. <laughs> the situation with Tom Brady, how he retired. And then three months later, you know, sacrificed his own relationship to, yeah. to keep playing again. Cause that's the only thing he knew. Like he just yeah. he probably couldn't picture a life outside of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that, yeah. does that play a role too? in, in your decisions, like, do you see a life outside of baseball or ha like, do you have any other aspirations that you'd like to, or have been, you know, going towards, or how has that been outside of baseball? Yeah, no, I definitely do. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I've been playing for a long time. Um, but I also, you know, I, I sort of understand the fragility of what I do as a, as a relief pitcher. Um, I'm, I'm only, you know, a few bad games away from, from getting released or getting traded or uh, potentially never playing again. I'm also one injury away. You know, if I have another shoulder surgery, I've, I've already had one. Um, there's a good chance that no team is going to want to pick me up, you know, and, and then, you know, you're spending a year rehabbing to potentially get a contract somewhere. It's, it's really tough. So um, I'm definitely someone who's constantly looking for new opportunities and, and new, uh, new paths in my life. Um, I'm definitely thinking about what's next. I don't exactly know the answer to that. You know, it's one of those things where you got to be two feet in if you're right. going to keep doing it, right? Like I, I can't compete against these young guys uh, who have all this energy and are super focused every single day if I'm not going to be the same way. Um, so I have to maintain that, but I also have to be smart and know, you know, I got a, I'm, I'm married now. I got a wife and, um, you know, we want to be able to build a life after baseball. Absolutely. And, and also, you know, you, you kind of touched on it there, the, this 
newer class that's coming up and the, the amount of work that goes into it for you specifically, um, you know, what is the hardest part about that grind uh, year in and year out? I mean, during this, uh, you know, during the regular season, you're training, but also the off season, you're mm-hmm. training still. So is that like a year long? Like, do you get any time off to just like decompress or, um, you know, how has that been for you the last, you know, 13, 14 years? Yeah. So my last, my last year has been crazy. I don't know if we were going to touch on it at all, but I did just play in Japan for the last season. Um, so I went and lived in Osaka for a year and, um, that allowed me to sort of reset my mind. It was a time where I wasn't sure that I wanted to keep playing baseball. I wasn't sure that I was going to get a job anywhere. I was kind of trying to figure out what was going on with my life. And, uh, a contract offer came through in Japan and it just, it ended up working out perfectly for my wife and I, um, and we moved out there and had a great time. I say that to say it was a long season, um, but it did allow for my wife and I to sort of reset a little bit. um, And baseball was a, was the primary focus out in Japan, but so was immersing ourselves in the culture. And so was, you know, being able to have a life experience that I don't think, you know, many people get. Um, So that part of it was really great, but you know, my off seasons are crazy. I mean, it's like a nine to five job, you know, I'm at the field every single day at, at 7am, um, throwing with, with some other guys that are in the area. And then, you know, my strength training and my cardio and all that stuff. I mean, it just, it, it takes most of the day up. So it's definitely not a, it's definitely not an off season, you know? Totally. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, like you said, it's a full-time job year in, year out. And it's incredible too, that you've been, uh, in the league for, for quite some time. How was it? I, I kind of want to touch on, you know, those starts that you got, um, in the MLB. How was that feeling? I mean, did you ever, we kind of talked earlier about you and your youth, um, you know, on those game days when you did have that chance to go on the mound and, and, and face some, some hitters and play some games, like how can you describe that feeling in a way, um, you know, relating back to when you were a kid of like having dreams of playing professionally, was it as surreal as you thought it would be? Or was it just any, like any other regular game for you? Yeah. You know, it's a funny thing. Like, so I, I got drafted as at, at 18 years old, but I didn't, you know, through a series of wild events, my minor league career was, was, uh, <laughs> ups and downs like a roller coaster and, and, um, I didn't make my major league debut until 2018. So it was 2010 to 2018. So there was like a seven to eight year chunk there where I really wasn't sure that it was going to happen. You know, um, I, I was, I was, I was going through surgeries and, and injuries and then just not pitching well and struggling and and trying to figure out like, what, what am I doing this for? You know, I just didn't feel like it was going to happen. Um, and when I finally made my debut in 2018, in the major leagues, I kind of just really wanted to throw one pitch and just be like, okay, like I did this, I can check it off. And now I just want to see like, can I do it? Like, can I succeed? Because if I can't, like I gave it everything I could, I can look in the mirror and say, I I poured my heart and soul into this and I just wasn't good enough. And that's something I can live with. Um, I just couldn't live with the idea of like, I kind of half-assed it. I got drafted, didn't really try that hard and just kind of flamed out after a couple of years. Um, and so when I finally made that first pitch and I had my first inning, it was against the Mets. Um, I was playing for the Braves and we ended up winning the game in the ninth inning. I, I got the win. It was just an amazing experience. Um, and to call it surreal is like, I guess so. But it was also something that like, I worked really, really hard for, you know? Like I was ready for that moment. Um, and I just took advantage of it. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible too the, the amount of, um, persistence that you had to, to, to work your way back up through the minors to get that chance, um, in 2018, uh, you know, it's almost relatable too to like, you know, I'm, I'm from Spokane, Washington. So I've been a Seahawks guy and, and this past season with Gino and what he's been able to yeah. accomplish. Um, you know, he was always considered the, you know, the backup or he didn't have a chance, didn't have a shot. They mm-hmm. were projected to go like get two or three wins this season and they made it to um, the wild card. So, you know, that in itself is proof that like persistence continuing to, to work towards something and, and fighting through, um, this adversity, it truly is like incredible. So it's amazing that you were able to, anyone will say that like, just to even have an opportunity to pitch on a mound at the highest level, 
um, is, is incredible. How was that, you know, those first initial years in the minor leagues, actually one of my buddies um, had requested a, a question and he was specifically curious about just the grind of the minor leagues and how difficult mm -hmm. that is to move up through the depth chart. And uh, you know, just like, do you, do you feel like you're making progress or is it just very like ups, downs, like kind of go into that minor league experience? Yeah. You know, it, a big part of it is it varies from team to team. Right. And that's, that's something that I think is slowly changing, which is like, it used to sort of be like, there were a couple good organizations that took really good care of you. And then there were a lot of organizations that didn't treat you very well. Right. You did not feel like a professional athlete at all. I mean, you're really making no money. Uh, you're living in an apartment with four other guys in like a two bedroom and you're asked to compete against, you know, world-class athletes at a world-class level. Um, and you're eating peanut butter and jelly every day, you know? So it's a very difficult grind. We play games every day. You know, there's 140 plus games in 160 days. I mean, it's, it's a lot of baseball and you have to really love it and really be addicted to, you know, just trying to be better than the version of yourself yesterday. Um, but the the grind was interesting because it's it was so fun when I first started and I did so well and I became one of the top prospects in baseball and, and really enjoyed it. And then I got pretty sidetracked and things got really tough for me. And all of a sudden I completely lost my ability to get guys out and I started really, really struggling. And all of a sudden that thing that I love so much became this extreme sense of anxiety and pain and really, really difficult for me to go to the field every single day. And every single day I want to just quit because I'm like, I don't want to do this to myself anymore. And I think the thing that's very hard about what we do is so much of it is out of your control, right? Mm -hmm. Like, even if you're pitching really well, I mean, there could be a guy at another level above you who's pitching better than you and you, you just have no chance to move up, right? Like you just, there's so much out of it, like that you just can't do anything about. And it was that feeling that made me feel very, very anxious and very concerned about what everyone else is doing and it just really derailed my career for a while and it wasn't until I sort of wrapped my head around the fact that like all of that is external noise none of it matters the only thing that matters is when I'm holding the baseball am I throwing it where I want to throw it because after that it doesn't matter right like if I put a fastball right on the corner right where I want to throw it and he hits a two-run home run I mean it happens right like that's the way it goes and um Pitching is really just a, an imitation of life, you know, and I, I think that it's it's made me such a stronger and more resilient person because of that. I love that. I mean, we're getting into some topics, too. You had mentioned the um, the anxiety that you had felt in, in almost like these feelings of, you know, why? Why am I doing this? Why am I here? Uh, yeah. And part of the part of the big um, mission and goal with Still Human is is the fact that, you know, we're all still human at the end of the day. People feel things people go through things it's not all glitz and glamour all that um and you know one of the things i wanted to touch on uh you know how was that character development for yourself going through such a difficult phase of your career like that when things weren't just you know, just weren't clicking um and you were feeling anxious like where did you go was it a was it a mentor of so sorts that you had or was it a practice whether it be meditation or calming your brain was it just throwing a baseball that got you back in the zone like what was jesse's release to get away from those distractions and and kind of feel yourself back into you know your your truth yeah no i, I think that's a good question i i really appreciate the the still human um credo if you would i mean i feel like there's something to especially with athletes and i imagine musicians as well like performers in general like that's who we are athletes our performers, right? Like we're asked to perform for everybody every night. Um, and there is this sense of, you know, especially with the influx of like legalized sports gambling, where we just, there's so much riding on every single pitch um, for every single person who's watching. And they, they, a lot of people forget that we're human beings and that like, you know, yeah, you might've lost some money, but like, this guy had a bad game because his girlfriend just broke up with him. You know, like there's so many things that are happening around our lives. Like baseball is what I do for work, but like, it's the same, it's a job, right? Like it's a job, just like any other job. I work for a company. I show up every day. I punch in, I punch out. Um, and I have bad days. It happens. And, and that's the, 
the part of it that I have to honor and I'm still learning, like to answer your question, I don't know the answer, right? Like I'm very much still learning about what it takes every day for me to get to the field and for me to like do what I do and, and kind of embrace the anxiety that I've worked up. Um, but I, I have definitely daily practices, daily um, things that I lean on. I have people in my life that I'm very, very fortunate to have that have been really, really instrumental in like kind of getting me through some really rough times uh, but I still have them, you know, I mean, there's, there's still no worse feeling than, you know, pitching in front of 40,000 people and just doing really badly. Like yeah. it's really tough. Um, that's a, that's a very, very difficult feeling. And I thought maybe if I went to Japan and went through it again, like it, it might be easier, but no, it turns out it's the same, right? Like it's always within me that, that, that feeling is coming from, you know, and, you know, it's just something that I've learned to deal with and and battle with, but you know, I think everybody goes through it. Totally. And, and, you know, one of my favorite quotes is like, you're only as good as the information you have. And a lot of people that are in the dark or might not understand how to work through those moments, you know, a simple document or a PDF or a therapy session, whatever it may be, and, and becoming yeah. educated on why you're feeling those things or what's going on in, in that portion of your life. You know, it's funny because as a professional athlete, every single day you're, you're taking the human body to the limits, you know, you're testing the limits of what the human body can do. And in a professional environment, they pour millions of dollars uh, in training and sports training and, and what's the next best tool or this or that to make your body perform at that level. But at the same time, I think it goes unnoticed that you're also doing that with your brain as well. And your mind, you know, you're testing your, um, yeah, you're, you're, you're just your mind. Uh, and, you know, like you said, when you go up on the mound and you have a, a, a bad game in front of 40,000 people, um, not only is that hard, obviously, on your on your body, but on your mind, too. And to be able to have tools, the same amount of tools that you have for your body, like physical yeah. therapy, all that stuff, I believe that people should have, too, mentally just to be like you just said, you know, it's a bad game. Everyone has a bad game. You know, you don't go on Twitter and look at all these bullshit ridiculous social media. I mean, that's the thing that I can't stand the most is um, you got these people on couches watching TV, these professional athletes like yourself who have given your entire sacrifice, your entire life for the game only to be seen as, like you said, sports gambling, like, Oh, what the fuck? Like you ruined yeah. my, my slip or whatever. It's just like, one yeah. Of, what, yeah. One of my favorite quotes is that quote, um, you know, the man in the arena. I'm not sure if you've, of course. Yeah. Yeah, in that quote. Quote. yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like nobody can really speak on something unless they've been in there doing it, trying it. Um, you know, so I, I really, I really commend a lot of people just like yourself too, that actually are out there doing it. And um, yeah, so that's my take. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's spot on. Um, you know, it, it's funny, like on social media, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll have a game. I, I remember I had a game. I just came in to pitch one inning against the Blue Jays in Atlanta. And I hit the first guy in the foot, just curveball right in the foot, first pitch. And I was like, shit. Um, and then I have a one, two, three inning and it's fine. Like no run score. Okay. All right. Going to the next inning. I go inside, do my workout game ends. I go on Instagram and I have a message from this guy. And it's like, the first thing is just like how he wants to kill me, how he wants to, you know, do horrible things to my wife, like truly like heinous stuff. And, and I'm like, all right, all right, guy, like, okay. And then the next message is, um, oh, my bad, good <laughs> inning, right? So he saw me hit a guy in the foot, sent out basically like they wanted to kill me, some horrible stuff. Then he sees, okay, I got through the inning and he's like, hey, I'm a big fan. I think you're great, like really good job. And then whatever, okay, I don't pay any attention to it. A month goes by and he sends me another message. Hey, any chance I could get tickets <laughs> oh for the game tonight? <laughs> right and two things on that point one uh, there's an unsend feature so this guy could have just unsent the message right but he wanted me to see it i'm not really sure what that's about but two to me that is a perfect example of why he said he hated me he said he loved me in the same inning and that is why i can't pay attention to either because yeah. to me both of them are not real right like both of them are I hate you if you're doing bad. I love you if you're doing well. But neither one is me, right? Like, 
I can't, they just, neither one can affect you. You have to just block out all of it. The love, the hate, it all has to go. You have to focus on the one thing that matters, which is, am I throwing this baseball where I need to throw it? You know, that's the only thing that matters. Yeah. And it's, it's funny too, because you, you mentioned that a couple of minutes ago, how at the end of the day, it's, it's just strictly about how you throw the baseball and, and, you know, there's all this other, all these other distractions, whether it be the media, you know, from the press, social media, you know, yeah. agents, whatever it may be, so many distractions. And really, it sounds like, you know, after talking to you, like you just said, it's like how the, the real game is like, how can I push all those things aside and yeah. stay focused for, for as long as I can? Because yeah. the minute that you get involved in that drama, and then that comes back to you, and then you're on meme accounts, and you're doing this, right. and that, it's just this spiral of bullshit, like endless bullshit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, man, it, it just, there's so many things that nobody really truly understands of what it takes to, to be on a big scale, like the, on a big stage, uh, in a professional environment and still be expected to keep your cool, keep your composure. Um, so yeah, yeah. it's interesting. I mean, it, it's, t it's tough, but I think we're starting to kind of see a resurgence in athletes across the board, even the Olympics and soccer players and all this who are just fed up by it. And they're just like, yeah. pretty much like, fuck you guys. <laughs> like, yeah, look, I mean, I I'm all for fans feeling how they feel, right? Like, right. I get it. You're mad that I gave up that home run. I get it. You know, you're frustrated about all of the things that are happening. You're, we're losing. I get it. You're a fan. You paid a ticket. You want to be here. You want to see us win. Awesome. I totally understand that. Be mad. You can boo me. That's all right. But it's really important always for them to know that there is nobody who is in more pain than the player. Right. Like I give up that two run home run and I just lost the game for the team. I promise you, no matter how pissed off you are that you just paid all that money to, you know, watch me lose the game for the team. Dude, I got to move now. I like just got released. I got to, you know, like that's, yeah. that's what my life is. Now my life is like, you know, that was the thing that was so interesting is like when you get to the major leagues, you realize like this thing is fleeting. This thing is a shooting star. You need to hold on to it if you can do your best to hold on to it for as long as you can. But like, especially as a relief pitcher, we, we are a dime a dozen. We are viewed as like interchangeable parts. And if you have like three bad games in a row, like you got to move, you know, yeah. you gotta, you're gone. And that's really tough. That's a yeah. hard, hard place to succeed in. Yeah. And when, when fans see the headlines of so-and-so traded here, it's almost like they think it's this fantasy game world where they're like, oh, they get traded and now they just automatically play for this new team. But behind the scenes, like you said, you got to move, you got to disrupt your routine. You have to work with a whole new set of coaches, be with new players, learn, play. Like it's just, yeah, the amount of change that is required it's more than just a, a you know a, a, a tabloid or whatever <laughs> like yeah, yeah so yeah i mean yeah. we just witnessed a perfect example of it at the, the with the Bengals. um that final play with uh joseph osai um getting the uh penalty uh against patrick mahomes and he started crying on the sidelines and uh even his teammates some of his teammates you know were turning against him but then um later that night in the locker room when they interviewed him he actually had one of his teammates there to make sure that the press didn't you know ask any stupid ass questions they still did of course yeah. um but seeing him with his head down crying like t like his eyes were all puffy that is like why i'm trying to do what i'm trying to do with the whole still human thing is because it's just like that he's still he's still a human he has emotions he he just let it he feels like he like the whole weight of the world is on him he just let it he feels like he let his team down uh, his teammates down, his fans down, and people are still going on Twitter saying, fuck this guy, this guy's yeah. this, that, but I hope yeah. your career ends. I hope you have get injured, all these things. Um, you know, and, and that's why I have in my photo series, that's why I have everyone look at their hands. Cause it's like, you got to stop idolizing these people. You got to realize that they're, they're no different than you at the end of the day, they have feelings, they have, they make mistakes, they fail. Uh, they're not perfect. You know, they're not going to put up 30 40 points for your stupid ass league uh fantasy league that nobody gives a shit about like it's just it gets it gets to be much and so when i see those things on on tv it's just like damn i mean i at first i mean everyone had that reaction i was like 
you can't do that. That's a that's a very of course dumb mistake. But then to take it as far as the people that did on social media, and then to see that interview, like I said, of him with his head down and his teammates are backing him. Um, it's like, yeah, man, this guy at the end of the day, he's got to go to sleep at night. So I think the, the the interesting part about that specific story is so it's so um, <laughs> earlier in that drive, I believe, at least earlier in the quarter, the commentators were were noting all of the good plays that he was doing. And yeah. I can't remember who one of the commentators said to the other one, like, man, we've been saying Joseph, a, a size number like a lot tonight like he's having a heck of a game and then within five minutes he makes that play and and that to me is just like such a microcosm of like what it is to be an athlete is he is like as high as he can be where he's having an unbelievable game on the biggest stage and he's just wrecking play after play after play and then there is this split second where he just doesn't know where the sideline is and he pushes Patrick Mahomes because he's a football player and he's yeah. trying to make a tackle. And he's just pumping full of adrenaline. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everybody's talking about him getting released and how he's, you know, a waste of talent. You know, it's just like it's yeah, it's why you have to find that inner peace and that sense of just like when the commentators were talking about how much they loved me and they were talking about how much they hated me. None of that was real. You know, like you lean on your brothers, you lean on your you lean on your teammates you lean on the people who know you as a person. Everybody else is just kind of white noise and you just block it out and you just focus on what you need to focus on. And it's the same thing with any job, I imagine. Not that I've worked a ton of them, but <laughs> you know, like you yeah, got to CEO focus on Jesse Biddle. little things. I mean, you know, I'll be a CEO one of these days. Maybe not today, but in the uh, you are you already are a CEO. Mm. Jesse, Jesse Biddle the boss. Yeah, damn right. <laughs> I'm trying, man. I'm trying. No, I, I totally, you know, I agree. And and I felt bad myself too. Cause when I watched it on TV, I was like, what the fuck? Like, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you fuck that up? And I was like, texting my boys like, oh my God. And then once I saw that interview, I was like, dude, this, guy, this guy's human and you just make mistakes and it's one mistake in your career and, you know, don't let it define you. And we're, um, we're probably 48 hours later. That guy has not slept. No, you know? Like that's the thing. like, I, I lose sleep over this thing because it's my life. Like, yeah, I might've cost you $20 in a bet because I gave him a home run, but you're going to sleep fine. You know, like this is my life. Don't forget who's the one who actually did. Like, I promise you, man, that guy is, he's going to pour his heart and soul into this off season and he's going to come back and be unbelievable next year. But like, I don't know. I think part of it is just like the best athletes are the ones who learn how to use it as motivation and use it as fuel. Cause I've had a very hard time with that. It, sometimes it takes me, it takes me a while to be able to like get myself back on track after, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have a tendency to spiral. Like it's really difficult to, to get yourself back to where you need to be to execute. Totally. Well, talking a little bit more too about that, uh, losing sleep. Did you ever, you know, lose any sleep over some games of, of pitch or uh, any uh, batters that you didn't want to face or that you were nervous about? Like, did you have any specific players where you're like, Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I would say like probably the biggest home run that I've given up where was uh, against Bryce Harper in 2019 um, and I had had a lot of success against him my whole career. We were drafted the same year. We came to the minor leagues together. I played him a lot when we were both younger and, you know, I, I know him a little bit. He's an awesome guy. I've always just enjoyed competing against him because he's the best of the best. And, um, I was having a lot of confidence going into this at bat. It was when he had just, it was the first series against the Phillies and, um, he hit a ball. I don't know if, 14,000 feet. I can't even tell you. It went unbelievably far <laughs> off of me. And I had never, I had always had a, I had always done well against him. And I gave up his first. So it was his first home run he ever hit with the Phillies. Oh, wow. Off of me. And I'm from Philly. And it was just kind of a weird thing, man. Like and I, <laughs> I got pulled out of the game after that. And um, I'm walking off the field and the crowd's going nuts. I mean, I've never been in a louder stadium in my life. You were and, in Philly? Uh, yeah, I was in Philly and, and and the crowd is just going insane and I'm walking off the field and I got all these people over top of the dugout all from Philly, 
yelling at me he was from philly telling me i'm a bust and i'll never amount to anything and all this Those stuff fuckers and, man like it just <laughs> it just hit so hard but it was like it just it, it stuck in me yeah um, and you know i'd go to sleep and i'd see that home run over and over again it's like that's just motivation though right like you can't let that be a thing that stops you from succeeding you have to let that be a thing that you learn from and we move on that's like the best the best lesson you can learn is just like how to keep moving forward and not get stuck looking backwards. That's Absolutely. when you get in trouble. And it's hard. Can't rewind time. There's no no way to do it as far as we know yet. No time machine. So there's no use in going back into the past and what has been. It's always going to be about, you know, what you're doing in the present moment and, and what's next. So um, I actually do have a, a personal like question that I'm curious about. Um, as a pitcher, when you do throw – and they just immediately make contact and hit a fucking bomb. Like obviously <laughs> like on, on camera, you always see the pitcher look behind and literally right when he looks behind, he just, he knows <laughs> like, I, I, I'm curious yeah. because when I watch, you know, Mariners games or games in general, I always am curious about that. And since you are, you know, a pitcher, do you guys, is it based off of the sound off the bat or is it just, you look behind and you, they just know, or like, how does, how is that? I think it's well, it's maybe a couple things. It's definitely, man, there is a sound. There is a sound <laughs> to that thing. And it is like it it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> it's, that yeah. noise. Every pitcher hitter, just I down. mean, these hitters that they love that sound so much. Mm -hmm. But when you hear it, because that ball just came out of your hand and you're like, ooh, that was a good one. And then you then you look up and that guy squared that ball up and you hear that noise, it like rings in your ears. Uh -huh. um, and then it's also just like, man, like <laughs> when you see kind of the speed of the ball, the trajectory of it, and you know where the fence is, you're like, I can't. What am I going to watch it? You know, <laughs> watching yeah. is not going to make it any better. Uh, yeah, that's maybe, a good point. Maybe if I look down, something will happen, you know, maybe, but it doesn't. It never does, man. That ball is always, it hurts. It hurts when that thing leaves the yard. Yeah, now we got all the stuff with the bat flipping and the trot and the base. I mean, I don't know if that's always been around, but it's just <laughs> I don't know, man. I, to me, whatever. Do it. Yeah. Do own it. your own your shit. Yeah. Yeah, man. You wanna you wanna like you wanna bat flip? Go for it. But don't bark at me. Yeah. If I do a little kind of trot off the mound after I just struck you out. Totally. You know? Like let's let's be gentlemen about this. Also, you know, there's a sweet spot to it, right? Like bat flip sure do a little dance sure don't take 40 minutes to get around the bases you know i got places yeah. to be i you know we we, we all we gotta, we gotta <laughs> yeah I, I know i always picture a uh, a pitcher going off the mound and just being like hurry this fuck up like go walk the come bases. come on let's go come on we there get is it nothing, there is nothing in sports that is like a home run trot i guess maybe you when you get like a little touchdown celebration right yeah but there is this thing where we like it's it's just baseball. You hit a home run, and everybody now has to like just kind of watch you run around the bases. There's nothing <laughs> like it. I, I'd be curious. I'd be curious to see if there was ever a player that was just, almost like a um, Kawhi version of just like didn't give a shit, like zero motion, and just like hit a home run and sprinted around the bases. <sighs> yeah. What? Who is it? Uh, <laughs> uh, Brandon Nimmo with the uh, with the Mets. He's known for his like fast home run trots. He's just kind of <laughs> oh, yeah, just, just Charlie Hustle. Yeah, I mean, I, I like uh, you know, I like a little swag to my players. Like as a as a pitcher who sits there and watches so much baseball, I love when my when my guys are out there having fun. I want you oh, to yeah. show who you are. Like that's when that's the only way that baseball is gonna like become a mainstay in in popular culture. Is like we need to show personality. Totally. That's the biggest reason that a lot of sports die is because, I mean, it always comes down to the players and, and yeah, I mean, obviously you want, you're in a professional environment, but you still want those big moments to feel big. And it's just the, still the grand scheme, like the grand entertainment, you know, you got the fireworks going off, people are going fucking crazy, beers are being thrown and it's just yeah. like, fuck yeah, throw that bat 40 feet in the air. Dude, I, you know, it's, we <laughs> playing in Japan, it is such a it's a much more participatory like exchange between the players and the fans. Um, I gave up a home run in Japan 
another absolute bomb to this like really legendary Japanese hitter. And I just hung a curveball and he hit it a million miles and he runs around the bases and he like goes to the end of the dug. He high fives everybody on the dugout. And then he does this thing where he like kind of puts his hands up and then the entire crowd did it back to him. Oh, wow. And I was like, what? I didn't know. I had no idea what that was. I never seen it before. It like scared him. What the hell is going on? Um, but it was so like, look, I mean, it was a home run against me. I didn't love it. Like, in the moment maybe but like it's cool like that's the fans feel like they're a part of the game right and and they feel like they know that player um and i just think like we need more like we just need more personality to come through in this game i think it's a game so rooted in tradition and history which is great but how do we utilize that to create this like new tradition and new history Absolutely. Get back to some rivalries. And I mean, that's why baseball was so popular, even during like the Yankees Red Sox era, because it was just brutal, man. It was just crazy. But, uh, you know, before we wrap up, I have one more, you know, question. Uh, now that you're, um, you know, you, you've got, you've been in the league, you've, you've seen a lot, you've been through a lot. Um, you know, if you were to be in a room full of some of the best pitchers, 17, 18 years old, uh, and you had a few minutes with them. Um, you know, what were some, what, what are some things that you'd touch on or, or talk to them about or advice that you'd give? Um, you know, I know that the game is, is a lot different now than it was maybe when, when you were that age. Um, but since you've been in the league, worked with these coaches, um, been through it all, what, what are some things that you would say to these young, uh, athletes coming up? That's a good question. I think I'd probably have a lot of advice. I have a tendency to be a little long winded. Um, but my, I, I guess my, 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 my advice would be like, try to find a good coach and stick by that coach. Like, I think everybody has somebody who can speak to them in a way that they need to hear it. And um, if you're 17 years old, 18 years old, like, always be willing to ask why. And if the coach is unwilling to answer why or unable to figure out why they are trying to make these suggestions to you, uh, that should be a, a pretty clear sign that that might not be the right coach for you. Um, I, I just think it's so important to find that person who inspires you and keeps you moving and keeps you motivated and keeps you hungry because this game will eat you up. I mean, it's a, it's an incredible grind to get to, to the next level, every stop. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really difficult. So you need to find those people that, that help you. Um, and so just ask questions, be curious, try to learn and like, just be obsessed with being better than you were yesterday. Cause that's the only way that you're going to get to where you want to get to. Amazing. Well, I, you know, I think that you're spot on with just how anyone that's in a position, especially our youth, they need to be with people that care and want them to succeed and see, you know, there, there are careers out there that I'm sure that have been made simply because they got a chance from a coach or they got a chance from someone because they saw something in them that maybe other people that are very transactional or whatever didn't yeah. see. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, that's amazing. Well, we've been talking about looking ahead into the future. You just signed uh, with, with the Diamondbacks. What do you got going on for this upcoming season? Um, and and talk about a little bit about that too. Yeah, yeah, no, really exciting. Um, it's a great organization. It's uh, a lot of, a lot of talent, man. I'm excited to just like uh, kind of soak it in. We have just, I've talked to a few different coaches and front office people since I signed with the, with the team and they got a lot of good minds there, man. A lot of people I'm excited to just hang out with and get to know and, and uh, to learn from. Um, I just wanted to go somewhere that was going to make me better and continue to push me. And I, I think I found the right place. Amazing. Well, you know, congrats on that. And and that's words to live by too. You always want to be putting yourself in a position to learn and grow and, and be better. So that's, that's amazing. Um, Jesse, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to be on. This has been so much fun. I appreciate you and, and all these, um, you know, I, I, it's been fun, man. It really has been fun to just learn about some of the things that aren't really talked about a lot too, especially for professional athletes. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll maybe do this again down the road a year from now or something, see how the, yeah. the season went. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Jesse. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. I'm glad we were able to link up. Uh, I really, uh, I love what you're doing. 
Thank you so much. Well, uh, we'll uh, we'll be in touch and um, we'll be we'll, we'll be watching you, looking out for you. All right. Sounds good, man. Appreciate you, brother. Later.